السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنهم فتية آمنوا بربهم فزدناهم هدى So when you're gathering with the remembrance of Muhammad and wa Ali Muhammad As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Nabiyina wa Azimina, Rasulullah and his honorable and purified progeny recite the second salawat. For Allah to shower onto this gathering with his infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance. Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al-Asri wa zaman recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. The millennials, a generation between the ages 25 and 45, are rapidly changing the world today. During the pandemic, we saw that the millennials were able to achieve what governments and armed forces could not have, could not have achieved in years. They were able to bring to its knees the greatest financial institution, Wall Street, by introducing a terminology, by introducing a phrase that went viral on the Reddit army, known as Diamond Hands. What diamond hands meant was for the millennial sitting at home to hold on to a $2 stock, GameStop, and literally take it to the moon. What diamond hands meant was no more control of Wall Street towards our finances. What Diamond Hands literally meant was people becoming millionaires overnight. We also saw that the millennials inspired people around the world 
to stand against forms of injustice and tyranny. Beginning with the Arab Spring, a young man in Tunisia, 27 years old, Muhammad Bu Aziz, began what's called the Arab Spring that resulted in the overthrow of many governments, many political institutions, and similarly, during the pandemic, when people were bunkering up at home, the Black Lives Movement began in the United States of America and spread all over the world, all led by the millennials. Today you find that they are leading in many sectors of society. But what is unfortunate is that this generation and the generation after it, Gen Zs, are not on good terms with the religious institution. While they are leading the world into change, into reform, they find that the religious institution is extremely old school, traditional, stagnant, and therefore they're not on good terms with the religious institution. And this is not just in our school of thought, this is not just in Pakistan and the U.S. And no, this is every religion on all around the world. This phenomenon, if you go to the Catholics, you find that there is extreme criticism of the Catholics, of the way that the Catholic Church conducts its affairs. If you go to the Jewish committee, community, you also find similar sentiments about the synagogues and the temples and the seminaries that they have. Similarly, amongst the Muslims, we have the same sentiments. And mostly, you hear them in forms of Chinese whispers. People sitting in small circles, whether they're religious or not, whether they're practicing or not, they feel entitled to criticize the religious institution, to voice their opinion towards the religious institution, especially in this era, brothers and sisters. when the world is rapidly changing, when the iPhone was introduced, nobody begged us to go and buy an iPhone. In fact, people line up 24 hours before a new iPhone is launched so that they can be the first people to buy this iPhone, to enjoy this iPhone. Why? Because the iPhone makes your life easier. And every few weeks, every few months, the iPhone application, the operating application tells you that you must update this application for the latest updates. But what about the religious institution? Is it there to make our life easier, more convenient, more enjoyable? And does it update itself? Those are the sentiments that we hear, and we must address them. We cannot continue to run away from them and ignore them. Pretend they don't exist. Because the damage is much greater. If those individuals walk away from Allah, from religion, from Islam, then their generations will also not identify with Islam as well. I hear many individuals come and tell me, Sayyidina, what is the purpose of the Risala? Risala al amaliya the book of Masail, that continues, that contains thousands of laws. Isn't it for me, the average Jew, the layman, for me to read it and understand the fatwa of my scholars so that I can conduct that, incorporate that in my life? Yes, indeed it is, but I don't understand it. 
I don't understand what احتياط احتياط وجوبي احتياط أولى ترك ترك الواجب I don't understand those terminologies so I am even more confused and when it comes to prayers I want to conduct prayers there is a thousand laws how am I going to ever memorize all those thousand laws when it comes to tahara there is five six hundred laws when it comes to hajj there is more than four thousand laws isn't religion made to make my life more convenient more enjoyable and we must address such concerns and I tell you the biggest struggle awaits the new generation of maraja what do I mean today the Concern of our global community is when does the month of Ramadan begin? When does the month of Ramadan end? Which institution should I deliver my homes? And the likes of such questions. But let me introduce some hypothetical scenarios. And I introduced a few hypothetical scenarios a few nights ago and people were like, well, what's the answer to that? You didn't answer the question. I'm not here to answer every single question. The job of the member is to make you independent thinkers, for you to go and research, for you to think. The member is not an ATM machine. That is why today you find that there is no innovation in our community. Everything that you use in Muslim countries has, in, has been imported to you. Everything. Because we are used to just getting straight answers. Black and white answers. Oh, the job of the member is meant to make you think. So think about those scenarios. Whether you are a alim, president of a community. Imagine or a religious authority trying to conduct a marriage. Imagine two people come to me, they say, Sayyidina, we would like for you to conduct our marriage. Very good, let's do it. Give me your IDs. So I take their IDs. I look at the first ID, yes, it matches. This is brother Azrar. He's 26 years old. He's... I look at the other one, it's Akbar. But I look at Akbar, and it's a beautiful woman. And there she is with makeup, ready for nikah ceremony. Hey, I think you gave me the wrong ID. No, no, no. This is my ID. But now I have gone through a transition. I used to be a man. Now I'm a woman. What do we do? She's now fully a woman. What do we do? Do we conduct the marriage or not? This person married a woman. He went on a long vacation, came back, and the woman has now become a man. Is the marriage void or is it still valid? A father dies and he leaves an inheritance. And you know the inheritance of a man is double the inheritance of a woman. So before, prior to the father's departure, this girl went and she transferred. She transformed herself into a man. The father had a big fortune. Now what do you give her? Do you give her double? Do you give her the portion of a man or a woman? Those are legitimate questions that will be asked of the new generation of Maraj, the millennials. The crescent of the moon and the beginning of the month of Ramadan will be a thing of the past. In 2008, in 2008, there is something that came into life known as Bitcoin. 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. People are asking, is Bitcoin halal or haram? We still don't know. People are making millions of dollars, buying and selling. Elon Musk is selling cars with Bitcoin. We still don't know if it's halal or haram. And until today, we don't know. And this is why you find a lot of people losing faith in the religious institution.
they're not on good terms with a religious institution. When Islam came and when Islam was introduced in the Arabian Peninsula, it was a revolution of reform. It took the lives of those individuals that were living worse than animals, burying their daughters alive, creating a god out of dates, and then starting to eat chunks of their god from the morning until nighttime. By nighttime, the god is finished. And then what happens when you eat you? This was their, the way they thought of God. Women were not just not recognized, not respected. Just imagine for a second, they, were, they didn't receive inheritance. They were inherited according to the Quran. وَلَا تَرِثُ النِّسَاءَ كَرْهَا You cannot inherit this human as a slave. When the father died, he had 10, 20, sometimes more wives. The eldest son, he would inherit every one of them besides his own mother. This was a Arab tradition. And then he would gift some of them to his friends. He would turn some of them into servants. He would outcast some of them. Some of them he would throw out on the streets. Islam came with such a grand revolution to change their lives, to make their lives more beautiful. Aus and Khazraj, those two tribes, they were fighting for so many years. So many years. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam came and he made peace amongst them. وَكُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا Turn into foes. Turn foes into brothers. And when you read and you see the legacy of the Ahlul Bayt, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, the lifestyle of Ahlul Bayt, and they're dealing towards the religious institution, you understand the philosophy towards the religious institution. Number one, Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, One day he was sitting, as he became the Khalifa, the most powerful man. Qambar came to him, he said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, there's a delegation here to greet you. They're the representatives from all over the world. They're here to give you bay'ah, their allegiance. And Amir al-Mu'mineen was sewing his na'al, his slipper. He raised it. He said, Qambar, how much is this worth? And Qambar said, Qambar, he says, he had stitched it so many times that it was worthless. But I was shy to tell him it's worthless, so I told him, Ya Amir al muminin one dirham, one penny. He said to him, Ya Qambar, this whole khilafa is worthless to me than this na'al. If I do not establish justice, if I do not take tyranny from the zalim and give rights to the mazloom, if I do not establish equality, that is why all of the Muslims know the story and narrate the story and are inspired by the story. When the famous Arabian woman came with her slave, which was non-Arab, and Amir al muminin gave both of them one dinar, they went home, she asked her slave, how much did he give you one dinar? Then she saw that the slave also got one dinar, so she came back to Amir al muminin She said, Ya Ali, I think you made a mistake. I am Arab, I'm a free woman. She's a slave and she's a non-Arab and he gave us both one dinar. What happened there? You miscalculated. Amir al muminin he was sitting, he took two handful of the soil and he raised it. And he says, do you see a difference between those two? 
She says, no. He says, you were created from this, and she was created from this. I do not see anywhere in Kitab Allah that an Arab is above a non-Arab. كُلُّكُمْ مِنْ آدَمْ All of you are from Adam, or Adam and Turab. And Adam is from? It's Turab, this clay. However, today, by the way, when I say religious institution, what do I mean? Do I mean the religious schools, the madrasas, the masajid, the imam bargas, the seminaries, the speakers, the scholars? I mean all the above. The concern of people today, the question in the minds of people today, the Chinese whispers that you hear after people go and attend the lecture, they go home, what do they do? The sweetest thing for them to discuss is what was happening in the masjid and what did he say and if I agree and I don't agree and this alim did this and this alim said this. And this is... Today, sometimes what we see in the religious institution unfortunately is the exact opposite. They say that there was a, you know, in the old times, there was no running water in the bathrooms, right? There was public bathrooms in the bazaar, and you go and you use the pu public bathrooms, and there's a watering can. You guys call it lota, right? You have to have a lota. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what uh, this watering can was in Urdu. So I was in someone's house, a doctor's house. And I was in the bathroom. And maybe I took some time, you know. Some people think when they're in the bathroom, you know. If you don't believe me, go read Trump's tweets. It's all from the White House bathroom. So he came, he said, say it, say it. Do you need a lota? So... I thought this is a doctor, I took long, huh? so maybe some medicine or something. I said, no, 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 I don't need one. <laughs> and then I realized what it was. Anyways, so there is a public bathroom, and the person in charge to, dis to distribute the lotas, he quits. He says, okay, I retire now. So now they are looking for some new manager for the lotas. So someone, he comes wearing a suit, wearing a tie, is very formal, says, I'll do it. They say, sir, we, we think you're overqualified for this, you know. <laughs> His job is not for someone wearing a suit and a tuxedo and dress shoes. He says, no, don't worry, I'll, I'll handle it. Okay, bismillah. So he thought to himself, at this old age, now, I just become somebody who gives out lotas, it's not right. So let me first make a title for myself, and oh my God, some people, they love titles. They love titles. So he made him his first title, Executive Director of the Bathrooms. Executive Director of the Bathrooms and the Bazaar, you know, this is a big thing. Okay, now that he's the Executive Director, First day, second day, third day, some guy runs in and he really needs to use the bathroom. So he picks up one of those watering cans and he's running to go to the bathroom and this guy says, Hey, what are you doing? I took one of those lotas, I'm going to the bathroom. He says, come back, put it down. He puts it down, he says, take this one. Okay, takes the other one and he goes. Comes out of the bathroom, he says, okay, you know, now I can think. Why did you make me switch? What, what was wrong with the first one? He says, what do you think my job is? I have to exercise my authority. I have to let you know I am the boss here. There's nothing wrong with it. But you just undermine my authority. To some people, a position equals authority. He wants to make sure that we all know he's the boss. Amir al muminin didn't care for that. He says, I am a servant of the people. They told him, Ya Amir al muminin why do you sit right in front of your house? Go inside. It is hot. 
People are sleeping inside their homes. In Kufa, you know the, the heat of Kufa. He says, maybe somebody will come and they need me. And I, I'm not standing in front of my house so that they're embarrassed to knock at the door. And this creates a delay in me doing qada hawa'aj al nas. A woman comes while he was the Khalifa. She comes through the door, the adhan is already made, the iqam is made, Amir al muminin is in the mihrab, he's about to say Allahu Akbar. She shouts out, Ya Aba al Hassan. He stops. After iqama, he says, Who is that? They say, this is a woman, she came from a far distance, she needs to meet you. Amir al-Mu'mineen sits down in the mihrab. He says, bring her. They told him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. So salah, iqama. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, haqq al-nas is before haqq Allah. Let's see what she needs. She sits, she says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, the wali that you have sent, he's a good man. He's not corrupt, but he has one problem. He only hangs out with the rich doesn't hang out with the poor and they invite him to lavish dinners and parties and he's always there but in those parties poor people are not invited Allahu Akbar Allah. look at the Adl look at the justice of Ali that's why he says my justice and my Adl has not left me any friends he says bring me a paper and pen he writes his letter and he removes his Wali he removes the governor he says, you take this letter with you and you give it to him. He's removed. Number one, Amir al muminin looked at the religious institution as a responsibility, not as an authority. Number two, Amir al muminin defined the religious institution as an institution that does not revolve around personalities, but it revolves around the people, the community. Listen to what the community wants. Listen to their needs. Listen to their pain. Listen to their agony. That is how you built a strong foundation. That is how you have movements around the world. When you listen to their concerns, when you make them feel that you're an equal to them, you're not above them. Amir al muminin had many daughters. One of his daughters, she was seen on the day of Eid al-Adha wearing a beautiful pearl necklace. So Imam Ali says to her, oh my daughter, where did you get this pearl necklace from? This is very expensive. She says, Ya Abata, oh my father, I borrowed this from Abu Rafa for three days to celebrate Eid. Abu Rafa was a companion of Amir al muminin He was a alim, he was a faqih, he was an elderly man, well in his 80s. An honest man, a good man, a noble man. And he was the treasurer of Amir al muminin She said, I borrowed it from the treasurer, from Abu Rafiq. Amir al muminin got out of the house. He went towards the Baytul Man, the treasury. And he stood in the middle of Baytul Man and he shouted out, Ya Abu Rafiq! Abu Rafi' came, he's afraid. Amir al muminin what's happened? This is the day of Eid. Why are you so upset? He says, Ya Abu Rafi', what did you do? Why did you give this pearl necklace to my daughter? Today, it's the other way around. You didn't give my daughter, you go to prison. You didn't give my daughter, you're thrown out. Ya Abu Rafa, why did you give her the pearl necklace? Ya Amir al muminin I have a written statement from her that is sealed that she's borrowed it for three days and she, if she does not return it, she's liable for it. 
says, Ya Abu Rafi, if the letter was not there, I would have amputated your hand and her hands. Allahu Akbar. Why? Why, Ya Amir al Because this belongs to the people. This does not belong to Ali and his daughter. One day, one of the companions of Amir al Mu'mineen describes Imam Ali to one of his enemies. He says to him, Describe Ali. Why are you so infatuated with him? Why are you so in love with him? He says, No. I, you know, I would rather not. He says, No, you have my amnesty. Please describe him to me. And he describes him in many ways, but two of the descriptions stand out. Number one, Kana wallahi ka'ahadina. He was like one of us. When you go inside the masjid, Masjid al Kufa, while he was the Khalifa, you do not distinguish who is the Khalifa. You have to ask, who is Ali? Who is the Khalifa? He did not have a fancy chair, fancy dress. He did not have bodyguards. He did not place himself above the people. And number two, he says, one day I walked into Bayt al-Mal. And Imam Ali was in Bayt al-Mal. And there was a mountain of gold, and next to it a mountain of silver. And Imam Ali had his asa in his hand. He went to the mountain of gold. He hit it with his asa. Then he went to the mountain of silver. He hit it with his asa. He says, Ya Safra, O oh, the yellow. He does not call it gold. Gold for Ali is something else. Ya Safra, wa ya Bayda, and the white. Does not call it silver. Silver is something else for Ali ibn Abi. Abi ta'arrathti, you're trying to seduce me? Abi ta'arrathti, la khana khinuki. It is not time for you. Attallaqtuki thalathan. I have divorced you three times. La raj'ata fiki, and I will never return to you. Ya dunya ghurri ghayri. Allahu Akbar. Oh dunya, go and seduce someone else besides Ali. This was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was a man of the people. And number three, if you look at the legacy of Imam Ali, and you look at the legacy of his companions, you find there that they were not afraid of anyone and anything besides Allah. What's going to happen to my reputation? What's going to happen to my popularity? What's going to happen to my paycheck? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? When Imam Hassan placed him in his grave, there was a man who appeared, وَعَلَيْهِ سِمَاءُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And he resembled prophets and he gave a long eulogy. It's in Kitab al-Kafi. Go read this eulogy. This is the month of Ramadan. This is the month of the Shahada of Amir al-Mu'mineen. It's in Kitab al-Kafi. The eulogy there is mentioned. It's a very long eulogy. And in that eulogy, it is stated, لا يأخذه رحمك الله يا أبا الحسن May Allah have mercy upon you, O the father of Hassan. كان لا يأخذه في الله لومة لا when it came to matters of Allah, the religion of Allah, the teachings of Allah, he had no filters. He said it the way it should be said. They came to Imam Hassan, they said, Ya Imam Hassan, who is this man? We have not seen him. He says, Innahu akhuhu al-khidr. This was khidr, paying his eulogy to Amir al mumineen And similarly his companion, sometimes some people, they say, say it, you know, sometimes you say certain things, they're a bit controversial, you know. And it's best you stay away from them, you don't say them. Maybe this ticks this person off and this ticks person. I said, I wish you were there to give the same advice to Imam Ali. Because he never said the popular thing. I wish you were there to give the same advice to Maytham. They took Maytham and Maytham continued to speak of the fada'il and the manaqib of Amir al-Mu'mineen until they cut his tongue. 
And they crucified him on a tree, but he did not stop. In fact, before they took him, he says, I know the tree. I go there, I water this tree every day. This tree is my sadiq. This tree is my gateway to Jannah. Ammar, the same thing. Muqdad, the same thing. Salman, the same thing. And when Imam Zayn al-Abideen, salawatullahi wa salam, who asked to be given a chance to speak in the presence of Yazid, what did he say? Ya Yazid, ذلي لكي أصحد على هؤلاء الأعواد لأتكلم كلاما لله فيه رضا so that Allah is pleased ولهؤلاء الجلساء أجرا وثواب and those people listening, what do they gain? Entertainment? No. Ajran thawab, knowledge, ajran thawab. And that is a minbar that speaks the truth, that is transparent, and that guides the people. And this month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, is that month, is the month in which we seek guidance. Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس. Guidance for all of humanity. Today, while we see the entire humanity going through those Chinese whispers of not being on good terms with the religious institutions, we, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, must be the example of having a perfect religious institution, a flawless religious institution, an exemplatory figure for the rest of the world. Like every night, let us take some time in dua. And I urge the brothers and sisters to come on time. If we have said to come at 9.30, I see some people coming at 9.45. So come at 9.15, it's okay so that we can share those moments together, inshallah. But for now, we are trying to keep the nightly lectures, especially during the weekdays, lighter for everyone, inshallah. Let us raise our hands to Allah. Remember, we are in a masjid. We are in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you are facing the qibla, and we are in the month of Ramadan. We say, oh Allah, if until now, from the month of Ramadan, you have not bestowed your forgiveness upon us. You have not made us amongst utaqa'ika min nar You have not given us freedom from your punishment. Then we beg you to give us and grant us that tonight. While we are your guests and you are the best of hosts. Let us go to this beautiful dua of Joshan al-Kabir. لا يا من لا يشغله سمع عن سام or the one who hears everyone in every language anywhere in the world يا من لا يمنعه فعل or the one that is not distracted by one act or the other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees and witnesses everything and everyone. Ya man la yulhi qawlun an qawl The one who does not get busy with one thing and neglects the others. Look at how our Imam spoke to Allah. That's true, we can speak to Allah however we want, whenever we want, and whatever situation you're in. But those du'a teach you how to speak to Allah. They speak you, they teach you the eloquence. Ya man la yughallituhu su'alun an su'al or the one who does not get confused by the needs of his creation. 
يا من لا يحجبه شيء عن شيء يا من لا يبرمه الحاح الملحين The one who does not get agitated by asking him so many times and going back to him and begging him and nagging him. No, he loves it. He wants to hear you in dua. Ya man huwa ghayatu muradin muridin Or the one who is the ultimate desire of the mu'mineen, of the believers. Ya man huwa muntaha himamil arifin the one that the urafa, the ones who truly know him, are only busy with him and nothing else. Ya man huwa muntaha talabit talibin Ya man la yakhfa alayhi dharratun fil alameen O the one that nothing and no one can hide from him, even if it's a small atom. Let us recite this all together. Ya man la yashgaluhu sam'un an sam Ya man la yamna'uhu fi'lun an fi'l Ya man la yulihi qawlun an qawl Ya man la yughalituhu su'alun an su'al Ya man la yahjubuhu shay'un an shay Ya man la yubrimuhu ilhaahu al-mulihin Ya man huwa ghayatu al-muridin Ya man huwa muntaha himam al-arifin Ya man huwa muntaha talab al-talibin Ya man la yakhba alayhi ذرتون في العالمين سبحانك يا لا One more time, all the lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanak ya la ilaha illa ant al-ghawth. Ya man liman da'ahu mujib. Or the one who answers the call of those who answer, call on to him. Allah in the Quran says, قُلْ اَدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Just call on to me. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عَنِّي عِبَادِي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am near, I am right there. مُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَى Ready to answer their calls and their prayers. يَا مَنْ هُوَ لِمَنْ أَطَاعَهُ حَبِيبٌ الله أكبر those who don't have beloveds, those who don't have friends, those who feel betrayed, those who feel alone. You can have one Habib and that Habib will never leave you and never neglect you and never forget you and his door is always open, morning, night, he's never busy. Sometimes our friends give up on us, our parents give up on us, they're not available to us, but this Habib is always there. Ya man huwa liman ata'ahu is the Habib of those who obey him. Habib. 
يا من هو إلى من أحبه قريب الله أكبر the one who is near those who are near him who are close to him who keep him a priority in their lives who think of him he's also close to them يا من هو بمن استحفظه رقيب the ones who entrust him they say oh Allah you protect me he is their protector he is their hafiz he watches over them يا من هو بمن رجاه كريم he is kareem with those who ask of him and no one else he is kareem he is generous يا من هو بمن عصاه حليب he has so much patience with those who disobey him, the sinful ones. He's not out there to punish them, but he's there to forgive them. Ya man huwa fi azamatihi rahim, even though he's so powerful, but he's so merciful. He's so compassionate. Ya man huwa fi hikmatihi azim, the wisest. Ya man huwa fi ihsanihi qadim. As Ihsan is with you from the moment that you are born. Oh Allah, I am the one. I was nothing. And today, whoever I am, it's because of you. Ya man huwa biman aradahu alim. Oh, the one that knows who loves him and desires him. He knows them. Sometimes some people think they have to go out of their way to make their love known for Allah. No, 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 no. Allah knows who you are. Together. Ya man huwa li man da'ahu mujib. Ya man huwa li man ata'ahu habib. Ya man huwa ila man ahabbahu qareeb. Ya man huwa bi man istah. فضه رغيب يا من هو بمن رجاه كريم يا من هو بمن عصاه حليم يا من هو في عظمته رحيم يا من هو في حكمته عظيم يا من هو في إحساني قديم يا من هو بمن أراده عليم سبحانك يا لا your hands to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ten times نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم على عز الأجل الأكرم ten times all those who have حاجات knock at the door of Allah أمير المؤمنين says إلهي قرأت باب رحمتك بيد رجائي I've knocked at your door but not like you knock at the door of anyone else I've knocked at the door of your mercy and your generosity as a hopeless person and everyone besides you. Ten times. Ya Allah. يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم اللهم بحق محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من درية الحسين Every man and woman present in this majlis with a sin forgive our sins shower on to us from your forgiveness Oh Allah we ask you to allow us to have a genuine repentance a genuine tawbah. Allah, every man and woman present in this majlis with an illness, shower on to us from your cure. Allahumma adkhil ala ahli al-qabur al-surur. Allahumma shafi wa afi kulla marid. 
اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اقض عنا الدين وأجرنا من الفقر إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء وخدمة الحسين all the mu'mineen and mu'minat from your family from the families of the sponsors everyone that is present here let us recite Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha especially to the soul of the marhum Afdal Rashid Al-Fatiha Ma'as Salawat Sure. Before I proceed, just a small announcement. We've got a few Qurans left uh, in the Pakistan. We have many people who took their uh, speech. Just to re-emphasize, brothers and sisters, of the punctuality of time, we are here and we must give value to people's time and we must be on time and we must show our punctuality because we are at the dars of Qur'an. So I ask you all, inshallah, to be here prior to 9.30, inshallah, so that we can continue to have our program on time. If you all agree, I want to hear a loud salawat. Alaykum as wa then uh, we say this, that indeed they see, they see it far and we see it far, we're going to talk about it. But recently I heard some scholars, a renowned scholar, uh, that we mustn't stop adding our gates, that's the end of this event. Because if that doesn't happen in the next five years or ten years, we've been waiting for more than 11 centuries, then your kid will actually end up questioning your credibility and they will take this whole notion of Baiba and, um, and Zahoon for Kubra uh, And he furthermore said that we must wait for the big science to appear. The science that will lead to Zahoon, we must wait for that. So what if we don't get time? What if all the signs appear at the same time? What will happen then? What there's two, happen? There's, thank you for your question. There, there are two ways to look at this phenomenon and I have seen this there are people who tell you the whole is very near it's this year because this has happened that had happened and people are waiting and then when it doesn't happen they say okay maybe it's all a fake story and then there is another you know flip side that tells you the whole no no it's far we don't know the signs are not there so how do we treat this notion the imams have told us that do not ever designate a time. Do not say it is, you know, going to happen in a week, a year, a month, 10 years. Do not do that. So we're forbidden from that. But what do we do? How do we await as people who are muntabar? We await as if it's tomorrow. We're not saying, you know, as soon as the major signs reappear, I'll do my tawbah, I'll pay my dues, I'll start praying, I'll start purifying myself. So that when the Imam reappears, I'll be ready. No, you have to be ready now. You have to be ready all the time. And also pray for the reappearance of the Imam. Next. Any questions from the President? Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. So we frequently hear that we have to wait for the reappearance. Uh, so does this wait? Uh, have any other meaning than the than the little meaning, and uh, if we go with little meaning, 
who we strength to lose and is the same for women and men and elderly and the young this waiting waiting is a is a literal act you know you literally have to wait await the reappearance of the imam but uh, some people misunderstand what this waiting means, Me meaning that I wait, uh, I, the, even I have read in some books that we accumulate the wealth of the Shia and we keep it in a safe place so that when the Imam comes, maybe he wants to start the orphanages and the schools and this and that and the other. And for us, we just safeguard. This is the cor incorrect form of waiting. No, waiting while not doing something for the Imam is the wrong type of waiting. In fact, waiting means you prepare for his arrival. So we, if, you know, for preparing for his arrival is we prepare a community. We prepare the youth, especially. And that, that's why I believe such discourses and such gatherings are extremely important. Because they play a role in awareness. We're not here just for rituals. We're here to learn. We're here to to become aware individuals so that we can truly become one of the followers of the Imam. That's a sign of preparation. Also here we must inspire people to be charitable. So one person walks away and he starts an orphanage. Another person prints a book. Another person creates a library. Another person builds a school. Another person helps, you know, uh, with, with medication. And another. All this happens when we are preparing for the arrival of the Imam. So waiting does not mean that I sit there and I wait and I do nothing. Waiting means that I actually, the correct way of waiting is that I prepare through all the means that I have in my capability, the arrival of the Imam. My question is uh, uh, is a question which my friend asked me. So I will phrase that question in the same way. Uh, the question is regarding, as yesterday you mentioned about the importance of parents. So uh, uh, I will just, just put, put that, that question, question in my way that uh, I am living with my parents and my parents are old, so they are just living with me. And I think that it is mandatory for me to, you know, uh, look after them and you know to serve them it is a type of a mandate to me now a situation has come where the parents of my wife they were very uh, they were very well uh, about 10 years back but with the passage of time a time has come that they were living with their son but the wife of that son they can't have a match now my wife is asking me that my parents, like my wife's parents, they can't live with that son or their son. Now she is asking me that uh, bring my parents here with me. Hmm. Now I am in a state of a confusion that my parents are there with me. Now my wife is asking me, they should also come here and I can accommodate them. There's no issue of money and all that. But I, but I see otherwise that it's not, is it mandatory? Now my question is that, which my friend asked me that it is mandatory that I should keep the parents of my wife with me, with my parents, or I have just suggested them to, you know, to take your parents to the old age home and there they can look after in a much better way. So as you, you know, mentioned about the parents and all that yesterday and yesterday. So this question just came in my mind. If you can just give me the guidance on that. Thank you. Um, I believe that uh, this friend of yours should know that his home is also his wife's home. It's not just his home. This woman, when she left her father's home and she came to his home, she shares this home with him. It's as his as it is hers. Now, she cannot go out and work because he has. that's his responsibility to be the breadwinner. She's at home taking care of his parents, taking care of his home, taking care of his children. And now her parents need a home. It's more thawab. This is an opportunity that has come and she wants to now, just like she looked after her husband's parents, wants to look after his parents. And I believe that he should be extremely accommodating. Uh, because...
doesn't have a place. She doesn't have another home so that she invites her parents to another location and goes and takes care of them. This is her home. And it is not his Islamic duty to spend on her parents. It is a moral duty to do so. Last question. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.